Thank you, Hadi and Mohamed al for starting us with such wonderful music. Thank you um, uh, to you uh, for coming and joining us on a Friday night. Uh, my name is Clarice Rosa Sharif, and I'm the Senior Director of Literary Programs at PEN America. And I am thrilled, we are thrilled at PEN America to be able to bring back the World Voices Festival uh, to New York uh, in person with live events for four days. Uh, today is day three, and, I, and this is the finale for our day. So I have to say we have um, worked on putting this evening uh, together for many months, and we had a dream. We had a dream that we could bring wonderful poets from uh, around the globe and just really kind of uh, get lost in the beauty of language and the beauty of poetry. And this is our 18th uh, Pen World Voices Festival, and this evening, I think, is exemplifying the mission of the festival that was started in 2005. And the original mission was to celebrate the power of storytelling and literature in translation and to convene global voices from around the globe, across borders, across languages and culture. And tonight, these poets have traveled from very far to actually share the stage together tonight, and that's a beautiful thing. And after two years of how do I describe two years? After two years of, you know, frustration and flux and uncertainties, uh, many of us have turned to literature and many of us have turned to poems to find inspiration, uh, to deal and wrestle with our, uh, a range of emotions from grief, um, but anger, uh, but also joy. And I hope that tonight, uh, this is an evening that will bring you uh, some joy um, to take away with tonight. I would like to thank some of our community partners who contributed to making this event possible, including Featherstone Booktown, Verb Wellington, and Read New Zealand, and PEN America's Eurasia program. We also thank our bookstore partner for this, um, for being here tonight, and uh, I would really encourage you to grab a book and support uh, poets by uh, buying their work and sharing their work with uh, your community. Uh, this event also would not have been possible without the collective vision and wonderful imagination of our curation committee. The 22 uh, curation committee for the World Voices Festival uh, included brilliant minds and generous hearts uh, like Eloisa Amesqua, John Freeman, Diviani Saltzman and Louise Steitman. And just special shout out to John because he had that vision from the start. So thank you, John, for seeing it through. <laughs> for those of you watching on Crowdcast, welcome as well, and I hope you enjoy the show. The, the evening will be live captioned, and you can even select your language to follow along. So you click on the link in the chat. I think we should get started. Uh, I want to be sitting with you in the audience and take in the evening. And I just want to, just a note, if you feel like you're too close from the, too far from the action, just come down. I'm going to go and sit down right here. And I want to be close and just be able to um, kind of take in the evening and the work and, and tell our poets and writers that we're here in the house tonight. So feel free. I think I'm breaking a rule by saying this, but it's okay. Uh, it's a nine o'clock show. I say come closer if you are so inclined and join me closer in the front. Um, so now, um, as I said, these poets have traveled from around the globe and I'm really, really happy to have here tonight Kinesia Lubrin, Tay Tibble, Phoebe Janassi, Alejandro Zambra, Paul Tran, Helena Kruk, and Ia Kiva. Mio, um, Mieko Kawakami was unable to join us uh, but in person, but she wanted to send some words, and we'll be able to share that in a little bit. Uh, so now we're really getting started, uh, and please help me welcome our guide on this journey. Uh, we welcome poet, host, and educator, John Sands. Enjoy the show. 
<laughs> Hello. How we doing, everybody? Happy to see you. Happy to be here. We are thrilled to be sharing the work of poets from every corner of the world tonight and a few from our own backyard, uh, which is called Brooklyn. <laughs> I don't know. It's that way. I'm mixed up now. Which way is Brooklyn? Um, uh, yes, we're very, very excited. It's going to be an excellent evening. Thank you for being here. Artists, writers, and especially poets are emotional historians. Through their work, they say, this is what it felt like to be alive now. These eight poets who we're going to be hearing from tonight catalog meaning. Tragedy, heartbreak, joy, catharsis. These poets find words that capture alienation and fear, confusion and tenderness. Tonight we get a global tour of our history and our presence. That is the power of poetry. I feel very excited. Thank you for being here. Let's get started. Our first poet tonight is Helena Crook. She is an award-winning Ukrainian writer, translator, educator, and literary critic from Lviv. And if all those things aren't enough, she is also an expert in medieval literature. She writes poetry and fiction for children. Tonight, she is going to read a poem translated by R.B. Lemberg. Please, everybody, put your hands together for our first reader of the evening, Helena Crook. Good evening. Стоїш із плакатиком нового, як індульгенцією за те, чого вже не відвернути, війну не зупинити, як яскраву кров'ю з розірваної артерії, вона тече стрімко, доки не вбіє. Заходить у наші міста озброєними людьми, розсипається ворожими ДРГ, у внутрішніх дворах, ніби смертельні ртутні кульки, що їх уже не визбирати, не повернути назад, хіба що вистежувати і знешкоджувати цим цивільним менеджерам, клеркам, айтішникам і студентам, яких життя не готувало до вуличних боїв, але війна вчить в польових умовах, в доболю знайомій місцевості, наспіх. В тероборону спершу беруть чоловіків із бойовим досвідом. Потім уже навіть тих, що мають за плечима тільки дюн і фалаут. Ну і ще короткий майстер-клас із приготування вибухових коктейлів від знайомого бармена у найближчому нічному клубі. Сплять діти, плачуть діти, народжуються діти у світ тимчасово непридатний для життя. У дворі на дитячому майданчику варять протитанкові їжаки і розливають смертельні напої сімейним підрядом, цілими родинами, які нарешті спізнали радість спілкування і злагодженої колективної праці. Війна скорочує відстань від людини до людини, від народження до смерті, від того, чого ми собі не бажали, до того, на що ми виявилися здатні. Мамо, візьми трубку, другу годину просить жінка у підвалі багатоповерхівки, вперто і глухо, не припиняючи вірити в чудо. Але мама її, поза зоною досяжності, 
у тому передмісті, де панельки склалися як дешевий конструктор від масованих ударів, де вежі зв'язку ще вчора перестали зв'язувати. Здовж перестали зв'язувати, де світ розірвався на до війни і після. Здовж нерівного згину плакатика «Ноуа», який ти викинеш у найближчий смітник, Ідучи із протестів додому, російський поете. Війна убиває руками байдужих і навіть руками бездіяльних, співчутливих. Вілли посестро спорожніли на осінньому промені, як на рожні, не обертаємось проти поглядів чоловічих спрах. Лих у столітті двадцятому з усіма нами сталося, що нікому із нас не вдалося лишитися при своїх дитячих ілюзіях, дівочих мріях, рожевих снах. Віли по сестру, розграбовані через одну. Матері наші добрі не вчили нас переживати війну, окупацію, депортацію, голодомор, гулах. Вчили хіба що закривати очі, коли закривавлений шлях лишає тіло чиєсь розтягнуте, розчахнуте, тіло твоє, моє. Перед лицем наруги. Чоловіче, Господи, ти ще тут є? Вілли, посестро, відбудуються, все забудеться, хай не зразу, колись. Сини наші стануть дорослими, довірятимуть силі більше, ніж нам. Доньки наші, граційні, пружні, як кевларове полотно, Міцніші за сталь. Хай не будуть такими, щоб прикладати до ран. Хай завдають ран. Хай навіть не будуть нам вдячні недобрим своїм матерям. Евакуація. У сні який заплутує сліди зимовий заєць. Тривожний звук висить в повітрі, як собачий гавкіт. Так двері із будинку відчиняєш на висоті, немов із літака, хапаєш ротом холод. Летіти вниз – це падати? Чи можна обставини змінити, переграти – Життя прожити, поле перейти, засніжене, жене мене все далі. Непевність сну, якийсь тривожний здогад. То хто тоді із нас не повернувся? Із виїзду у сіру-сіру зону, на клунках діти. Їх матері тримають за імена тривожні й гортанні, мов за рукав. Та хтось щоразу губиться і рветься жіночий крик і котиться луною. Я бачила обличчя, що від снігу біліші, паперові, мов мішені на стрільбищі. На відстані безпечні й наче лезо, що тне мене і тне. Розсипалися полем діти, діти, у кожному маленький заїць страху і серця барабанний дріб. В снігах буває, як сховаєшся, то тепло. Усе залежить від товщини нанесеного зверху. Цей сон, як сніг, 
його очима дивишся донизу, на маківки голів їжакуваті, на хаотичні зайчі сліди, на білому, на плутані розмови, на випадкові очі, випадкові прозріння, наче спалахи вогню. Ніхто із нас тоді не повернувся із цього сну. Thank you. Let's give it up one more time for Helena Crook, everyone. You may know our next author from her Booker-nominated fiction and recently released novel, All the Lovers, but Mieko Kawakami began her career as a poet. In all of her work, we hear the music of Osaka dialect. Its broad sounds lend an intimacy and humor to lyrics about love, the body, and modern existence. Now, unfortunately for us, we cannot hear this music from her in person tonight, but it is the year 2022, and we uh, thankfully have received uh, a recorded video of the day before for us all to hear and enjoy tonight. So please, all the way uh, abroad, put your hands together for Mieko Kawakami.前の日降り立ったそこには誰の姿も見えなかった。誰もいない。でも地面にはたくさんの掘ったような跡が残っている。そして掘り起こされた土は少しだけ湿っていて、まるでさっきまでここで誰かがこんな風に土を掘っていた
fine festival have asked me to remove my hosting hat for a moment um, and to share a poem of my own. Uh, oh, thank you, my one fan out there. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I, of course, was like, no, I, I couldn't. They said we insist. I was like, thank God. I really wanted to. I was dying to. So give it up for John Sam. Um, this poem is, uh, I'll just say, Keith Haring is a, a, a visual artist, or was a visual artist, is, was, um, and wrote a lot, had a lot of writings about kind of life versus the idea of living art versus the idea of art, and then ultimately, you know, like death versus the idea of death. And that felt like kind of a, an apt starting point for this poem. So it's called, Keith Haring says every audience member is an artist because they create the meaning of a piece of art. Or he said it. In the past tense, because he was alive when he said it, and now he is a thing we have all agreed is called dead. Dead is what happens when everyone who loves you wants to talk to you the same way they always have and can't ever again. Dead is when all of what you have made, love letters, birthday voicemails, your tongue into the shape of a clover in a high school photo is all that you are. Sometimes dead is kaput. Dead makes your acquaintances think of you more often, but it makes your true loves say, I don't know how I'll continue to live. Talking to the dead is a staticky connection, to say the very least. And saying the very least is what the dead do best. Because when you are dead, people say what you would have said. Your memory becomes a commodity. Your death, a commercial, which ends with a candle. I speak to the dead with my yearning. I can write to the bottom of a lake. And you, like me, might think it's nonsense. But you, like me, also suck sometimes. You, like me, can be so cynical. You'll look at death and say, prove it. You, like me, may have nothing left to learn from all that you can't see. It is unbearable to know so much, you stupid idiot. And there are things you don't know that only you can know. Give it up one more time for that poet. <laughs> and for indulging my uh, improv uh, skills here. Okay, um, like... Uh, the amazing Mieko, who we just heard from. Our next poet is best known for his five remarkable works of fiction, including his recently released novel, Chilean Poet. Whether in poetry or prose, he gives the small moments of our lives the attention that makes them feel monumental. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Alejandro Zambra. Muchas gracias, estoy muy feliz de estar acá. I'm going to read in English, but this was 
written in Spanish. So I would like to thank Megan McDowell who really wrote this for you. Two hundred twenty-three. You remember the freckles on her breasts, on her legs, on her belly, on her ass. The exact number, two hundred twenty-three. One thousand two hundred and seven days ago, there were two hundred twenty-three. You reread the messages she used to send you. They are beautiful, funny, long paragraphs, vivid, complex sentences, warm words. She writes better than you do. You remember the time you drove five hours just to see her for 10 minutes. It wasn't 10 minutes, it was the whole afternoon, but you like to think it was only 10 minutes. You remember the waves, the rocks, her sandals, a wound on her foot. You remember your eyes darting from her thighs to her eyelashes. You never got used to being with her. You never got used to being without her. You remember when she said in a whisper, as if to herself, everything is okay. You are not good, you are not bad, you are not wrong, you are not wrong, you are not right, you are not here, you are not here, you are not there, you are not gone, you are not gone, you are not around, you are not mine, you are not mine, you are not mine, you are not mine. Last night I dreamed you were here and I was here and we were lying together. Last night I dreamed you were coming and I was coming and we were coming together. Last night I dreamed you were lost and I was lost and we were walking together. Last night I dreamed you were lost and I was not and we were not together. Last night I dreamed you were sick and I was dead and we were almost together. Last night I dreamed you were a dog and I was a dog and we were barking together. Last night I dreamed you were a leg and I was a leg and we were dancing together. Last night I dreamed you were a tooth and I was a tooth and we were biting together. Last night I dreamed you were a nun and I was a priest and we were sleeping together. Last night I dreamed you were a ghost and I was a ghost and we were always together. Um, thank you. And this short poem called Garfield, like the cat who hates Mondays and likes lasagna. Every time a plane crashes anywhere in the world, Chilean newspapers report on whether there are Chileans among the victims. But my four-year-old son doesn't ask if any Chileans died. He asks if any children died, because children belong to the country of children, just as the dead belong to the country of the dead. That's what I think as I walk with my son through the cemetery, and I see him run off toward a gravestone where a paper pinwheel and a stuffed Garfield attest to a recent visit from disconsolate parents. My four-year-old son plays with a dead child's stuffed toy, 
and I'm afraid he'll want to take it home. But he says nothing, doesn't want to keep it. A few seconds later, he sets it respectfully back in the same place and says goodbye either to the toy, to the gravestone, or to the dead child. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Alejandro Zambra. Our next poet is a writer, editor, critic, and winner of many awards, including the Griffin Poetry Prize and the Wyndham Campbell Prize. Her work is remarkable. It's remarkable in its ability to look towards and not away from the atrocities of society and culture to help us understand our own humanity. Welcome this poet who the Griffin Poetry Prize jury cited as a writer who forms, invents, surprises, and sharpens life. Reading from her book, The Disgraphist, please help me welcome Kinesia Lubrin. Good evening. So lovely to see you all here, a gift after the last years we've had. This poem is dedicated to the impossible citizens of the ill world. Is it not enough to enter ending oneself in the halving road and the fires in us? blot the coasts that reject us and we sugar the desert we screed frantic for fullness if fragile if symbols if nothingness at first a doubt escalating our verbings if still ourselves a thing to become past wavering interests in peace given only for spilling Recall that face, which is no face, a craved choice. Eureka in someone's drawn God, I and the next could praise now. If I were not set ablaze enough, if that morning I hadn't the nerve. To lean into the world with an ear to a mouth, begging for the happened thing, for something disguised. What could prove this dust is freshly mouthed? Not come cyclic, newly vaporized empire, settling its faithless wages. Eyes, masses, these bent backs, enough. I pulls off eyes' toes and leaves them near the sea. Eyes see. Back to the sea as before, yet an hour's drift from Manzanilla, which is no place, but a word I loves. I knows what begins the act of saying things, what is lodged there, a promise of some life. Not unlike this cold gray sky, not unlike the not good marching band a street away, throwing madness out with eyes lonely discography. I says, please, without toes. But what about these feet, now that they are not seized in their act of marking things, disappeared things, things given over to the gesture, the method, to the field, a wash, an undertow. What is love but the hand returning to claim the dust, red, white, black, as a cold-swept evening? Yet, to be great in this gathering, the voice must bend toward apology. The tiredness of growing cold invade the wages of simple deaths. Sorry, Jejun says, Jejun is sorry. But for whom and what has I arrived? 
For whom does this dam fill the sky? These molecules blind eaten from that distance, as everything I learns about disappearance, rains lifetimes spent in this catastrophic crowd. So what if a wormhole? So what if the woman who wakes with jejune is reduced, irrigated, salted, harvested, and thrown again to exclamation points motored in the desert? With no word for anything needing built by hand, the mechanism of the spray. And I have been called many things late at night, greener grass, scientific utopia, dream of ancestors. What about rainy weekends? What about poltroons, the doomed cults full of hyper-rational people who've miscalculated the heights of doors? How many stairs are left? And when stood up from a tumble, find polite applause, find the romance of liberal consumption on the news. Anyway, any sharp thing is a short distance from possible to voluble. What about a foot laid down hard on the gloss of the business suited? The testing birds that remind me, I am just as committed to expression as to freedom. Thank you. One more round of applause for Kinesia Lubrin, everyone. Next, we'll be hearing from a poet who has integrated media, the classics, architecture, and verse into her seven collections of poetry, seven collections of poetry, as well as poetic installations around Europe with a breadth of work intersecting so many threads, it makes sense that her poems reach into the crevices of the heart and ask us to consider our own place in the world. Please put your hands together and help me welcome to the stage Phoebe Janisi. Τα τζιτζίκια ήσαν κάποτε άνθρωποι και αφού αγεννήθησαν οι μουσες και ενεφανίστη το τραγούδι, μερικοί από τους ανθρώπους ενθουσιάστηκαν από την ευχαρίστηση τόσο, ώστε τραγουδώντες παραμέλησαν να τρώνε και να πίνουν και χωρίς να το εννοήσουν, απέθαναν. And the gods turn them into cicadas. Ton di tithniti men e rotakalu si potinon atha nati Δε φυτών τε ρότα δια τερό φυτόρ ανά γιν. Έκλεγε τα παιδικά σου ρούχα που σε στρίμωχναν ήσουν αναγκασμένοι να αποχωριστεί για να μπορέσεις έπειτα, μες το καινούριο σώμα σου, να ερωτευτείς. Σκο, λιμόσταντι. Ή, μος δε, σκο, λιμόσταντι. Και είχε, τάτερ, τίξ δεν δρε, ο εφεζό, μένος, λιγυρίν. Κάταχε, βέτα, ειδίν, 
πυκνών υπόπτερίγων, θέρεος καμαθόδεος, όρι. Μόνη η φωνή επιθυμεί. Γλυκιά φωνή, λεπτή, σαν το μέλι πυκνή, ρέει και χύνεται κάτω στη γη. Ο τυθανός στο κλουβί. Είχε, τάτε, τίξ. Ενώ το γαϊδουράγκαθο ανθεί, ενώ το κάβμα κράτος εν κράτη, μέσα στο θέρος όλους μας κρατεί, το ηχηρό τζιτζίκι χύνει στο χώμα τη φωνή αυτού που ένα επιθυμεί και άδει, από το ρυθμό του ανεξάντλητα ζαλίζει, σαν τις ειρήνες ανεπαίσθητα κοιμίζει. Ο λόγος από μόνος του φυτρώνει. Υπάρχει, πέραν της απόφασής μας για σιωπή. Καθένα πλάσμα, ενώ τραβά το δρόμο του, στα άλλα τραγουδά. Αλλά τα νήματα των πλανητών είναι ξεχωριστά, όσο κι αν πλέκονται. Αρθρώσεις μισοξυλωμένων λέξεων που ενογράφονται, Ποτέ δε λένε αυτό που λένε, ούτε κι αυτό που νόμιζες πως ήθελες να πεις. Από τα τύμπανα μέσα στα σπλάχνα, ένα τζιτζίκι φωνάζει. Τραγούδι συνάθρησης. Ρυθμίζεται από τις κερικές διακυμάνσεις και τον χορό άλλων αρσενικών. Άσμα προγαμιαίας τελετής. Τραγούδι ενόχλησης. Κρωμός διαγμαρτυρίας σε αχμαλωσία. Όταν του πιάσεις το φτερό, τέτοιγο σε δράξο πτερού, το καλοκαίρι ο αδερφός μου έφαγε ένα τζιτζίκι. Τεροκοπούσε, κέτριζε, ξένη φωνή από το έρκος των οδόντων. Όταν το στόμα άνοιξε, ο Τέτιξ τόσκασε πετώντας. Σε λένε Τζίτζικα. Κοιτάς συνέχεια τη θάλασσα. Εσύ, Τζιτζίκι, δεν υπάρχεις πια. Έρχομαι να σε βρω. Ψάχνω στα αρμυρίκια. Η θάλασσα στενάζει από τον αέρα. Μία πλαστική σακούλα κρέμεται από τα κλαδιά. Εσύ, Τζιτζίκι, δεν υπάρχεις πια. Τα μαύρα μάτια του καλοκαιριού κλείνουν τα βλέφαρά τους. Please give it up one more time for Phoebe Janisi. Our next uh, poet coming to the stage tonight is a poet and a translator named Ia Kiva, born in Donetsk, Ukraine. Having fled the military conflict in her hometown in 2014, she joins us tonight direct from Kyiv. 
the winner of numerous international and Ukrainian awards. We are honored to have Ia share her haunting work, which paints a picture of the struggles many are currently facing under oppression and as victims of senseless violence. Please put your hands together and help me welcome to the stage Ia Kiva. Есть ли у нас в кране горячая война? Есть ли у нас в кране холодная война? Как? Неужели совсем нет войны? Обещали же, что будет после обеда. Собственными глазами видели объявление «Война появится после 14.00». И вот уже три часа без войны, шесть часов без войны. Что если войны не будет до самого вечера? Не постирать без войны, не приготовить. Чаю пустого без войны не испить. И вот уже восемь дней без войны от нас нехорошо пахнет. Жены не желают ложиться с нами в постель. Дети позабыли улыбаться и ропщут, почему мы всегда думали, что война никогда не кончится. Станем же, станем ходить за войной по соседям, по ту сторону нашего зеленого парка, бояться расплескать войну по дороге, считать жизнь без войны временными трудностями в здешних краях, считается противоестественным, если война не течет по трубам в каждый дом, в каждую глотку. Створили списань про войну подпильную гуманитарку. Вантажимо ее в Европу, Америку, Индию, та Китай. Торуємо шовковый шлях великої української літератури. Що ви за те, братчики, питаються на кордонах, мовчання вбране у кириличні літери, живий вогонь свідчучок літери Ї, нашу і вашу свободу лягати у землю любові, поламаними деревами довгої пам'яті. Що ви за те, братчики, питаються наші мертві, Історію роду з брудною шматою в роті, Трухляві скрині життів, діда і баби, Прабаби і прадіда, які ми століттями носимо На хребтах, мов Карпати. Що ви за те, братчики, питаються наші живі? Рушники воєнного епосу і розтягнуті Светри люті, недбалі креслення з мапами Нової Європи, Дитячі обкладинки майбутніх книжок. Що ви за те, братчики, питаються наші люстерка, Мідні грошики дихання в дірявих кишенях, Тривогу повітря у вибитих шибках ротів, Пульсуючі прожилки часу в червоних очах. From the cycle people of Donbass. Ілья. Зачем вы устроили дома войну и сбежали в нормальные города? Вороватые ложки соседей ударяют в ладоши и сбивают волос за волосом с моей головы. Вы во всем виноваты. А я думаю, вдруг придут убивать. А я голый лежу в лодке этого лета. Без воды, электричества, всякой связи. Никто не узнает, от чего она умерла. Стояла на кухне и навзничь упала, Как сахар в стаканчик бумажного гнева. И оглашенное море любви застучало в висках, Как снов карманный фонарик, которым я шарю. По стенам вины в ней живут какие-то люди, и домом зовут жизнь мою, как живую. 
Степная колючка солнца видеть себя не дает. Но я где-то там, в свалке дымящихся фотографий, целую, какое-то небо пока не горит. Фаина бьет в двери невидимой ночи, отрубленной головой, гнилая капуста отчаяния, мир стоит, как вода, выжженным криками птичьим горле угрозы. Пока мы все дальше и дальше в память уходим, вырывая с корнем сорняк языка, как шиповенный ветер из раны в ландшафте, за воротами смерти пустые гнезда корней, каменный свет над великой свалкой любви, детские страхи в замершей люльке дыхания. Мы же списки следов оставляем, как снег на полях, перепачканный кровью, свободой от текста, по которым деревья когда-то вернутся домой. Там раскосые звери на качелях огня и вины над оврагом хохочут бесчестного праздника и не чуют смещений земли под собой. Там, в петле у долгого эха, полое сердце звенит. Анна. Мы живем, где люди прежде держали корову. В душном полиэтиленовом солнце пробиваем отверстие для любви. А когда она разливается, идем по воде. От кровати к столу, от стула на подоконник. И висим, как трепье на краешке света. Мы проснулись однажды в печали истории. А заснуть уже не умеем, ходим кругами, Как в схлипы ребенка в замершем животе. Война – самый худший день моей жизни. Thank you. Please, one more round of applause for Ia Kiva. Our next reader, Tay Tibbles, debut collection is Pocahontas, a transliteration of the name of the Native American woman continually brought back to life by Disney. Born the year that film was made, Tay reappropriates the appropriated in a book that announces a voice stepping out from underneath myths like it and others. It is clever, funny, a post-colonial love song, shout out to Natalie Diaz, full of high camp, catwalk, and intimate lyrics about family life and lovers. The prose poems in this collection call to mind Claudia Rankin. Her second collection, Rangikura, is up for the New Zealand Book Award for Poetry. She is coming to pen straight from that ceremony, just like a superstar should. Please put your hands together for Tay Tibble. Hey, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko hikurangi me fiti matarau te maunga. Ko waiapu me awatiri te awa. Ko te whanua apanui me nati parau te iwi. Ko te whanganui a tara me Aotearoa a hau ko te te butuko ingoa. Nā mihi, thank you for having me. I'm going to read a couple of poems for you. And this first one that I'm going to read is called Hoki Mai. And Hoki Mai means to come back. And it was a term that was uh, used a lot uh, in New Zealand among Māori and the indigenous people during World War II uh, in a lot of waiata and songs. Um, and, you know, World War II was very controversial for lots of natives in, in New Zealand at the time. A lot of us wondered why we should go to war for people who were colonising us. Other people thought, you know, that's the price that we pay for citizenship. And um, it was also significant because... You know, after World War II, a lot of Māori women moved from their ancestral homelands, these rural places, down uh, to the urban centres, to the cities, for work. And um, this kind of talks to this time period. Hoki mai. 
She kisses him goodbye with her eyes still wet and alight from their last swim in the Awatere River. At the train station celebration, she leads the kapahaka, but her voice keeps breaking under and over itself like waves, like last night on the river bank, between the lots of moss and baby's breath where he had kissed her sticky until she cried out from her chest and she was thinking about the rolls of white fabric her sister kept in the shed and how she would make a dress pressed with shiny bits of shell. She could even fix a veil from the weave of a fishing net or wear knots of pale hydrangeas like a crown upon her head. And then together they would move to the empty plot of ancestral land forgotten by the sea and have little brown babies who she would make sure to stuff fat with potatoes and wobbly mutton. And then her children would slurp kinna in the summer, collect driftwood for the fires on the way home from school. And their father would take up a good job in Gisborne and return home with sacks of boiled sweets and powdery jam filled treats and maybe on special occasions a European perfume or powder that she would keep but never use. And already she could smell the florals and the meat, feel them turning inside her, sensation so visceral that she cried out from her chest. But when the sun lit up the day and the train started pulling away, with every salute, march and funeral wave, farewell, she felt the entire world changing and the lump in her throat swelled like the sea that threatened to take him from her and she had to swallow hard. But she promised that every day she would be the first to check the mail and that was the only vow she took. Okay, this poem is called um, Little Mermaids. <laughs> And um, in our culture, our, our bodies of water are so important to us. Like before, we'd, we would even tell you our name, we'd tell you what river we come from or what um, ocean we belong to or sea. This kind of talks to that and also just growing up, uh, being a young woman and growing up around a lot of water. Rinsing the sea salt of our, out of our bikinis with the drinking water and getting a slap upside the head from your mother with her home and garden magazine reserved especially for fanning away mosquitoes and sighing, because we know that this is how it's always going to be, because this is how it has always been, because for 13 years it seemed that life was nothing but a succession of hot summers and we were sure that we were Tangaroa's daughters, the way that we could adapt to each turn in the river. And I remember the year that we were the two strongest girl swimmers at our school. And this meant we were forever forced to race the boys for Western feminism. And you would always win, even against the boys, who were so like men that even the teachers tended to treat them as if they were more muscle than human. And in the damp parts of afternoons, we would watch them running laps and ripping papatuanuku up with their cleats, their teeth clenched around orange slices of rubber and te reo. Well, I felt sorry for them slapping kia mate ururoa, kia mate feke into their chests. Maybe they wanted to be dolphins instead, but that was our job, to dive dumb into the skin of the sea and throw our heads full of good hair skywards saluting the sun, making scenes of ourselves when we should have been slinging pippies into your mother's kete, reserved especially for carrying kaimoana. But I was a vegetarian and I didn't want to have anything to do with prying kinna loose from the rocks to offer up to the bros like pussy, them slurping and spinning while we flinch, oi, don't. And they just cheer each other on like a pack of crackling gods. And I can't remember where we were, but I can guess that we were probably doing what we were always doing during those summers that sweltered with a swagger, standing on the, stand, on the sand, picking out which surfers we wanted, or tanning on our backs in the soft parts of the riverbank, but somewhere between the boys and the wet centre of the earth, I said, hey, have you ever noticed the way the boys seem too witty when they're angry? The way their eyes roll back and their lips pull tight? That's adrenaline, you say, taking a thirsty glug of water. You want to bottle it, you say, 100% New Zealand pure. 
I'll just um, read one more little one for you guys. And, um, it's the last poem in, in, in my first book, and it's called Hawaii. And Hawaii is um, the name of our ancestral homeland that we, we legend to have come from before we migrated great, um, over the Great Timor and Nui Akiwa to New Zealand. But it's also, as you'll find out in this poem, the name of my um, baby brother. Hawaii. My mother, tired from pregnancy and being alive, named her last son Hawaii, like the paradise. Some people say it is where we go when we die. They say we dive straight off the edge of Cape Reinga and into the point where the sky hangs so heavy with spirits that it touches the sea. Other people say that is where we were before we came here by waka or whale or perhaps that was where we were before there was anything at all, where we meant something before we discovered, like Eve, God's forbidden fruit in the shape of an eye. I think it must be a womb where everything is born and returns to. Life and death are the colour red. They are the colour of a cosmic heartbeat rising on his fresh baby flesh, pinched between fingers and kissed. Namahi, thank you very much for having me. One more round of applause for Tay Tibble. Can we just pause for a moment and talk about how special it is that we're able to be here tonight and to hear poets from all over the world? In particular, after a couple years that have been largely characterized by grief and by alienation, it feels so special to be here, not just with them, but with you all. So give it a round of applause to yourselves for coming out to hear this tonight, for sharing space with each other. There's still time to make a new friend. You know, you can gaze around, give a wave, that kind of thing. That would be great. And I can think of no better way, literally no better way to close out a reading of this magnitude than to hear from our next reader. It is an honor to present a shining light in poetry named Paul Tran. Tran is a poet who loves language, who loves to push the limits of what language can and cannot define. They are a master class in precision and daring, in excavation and excellence. And their debut collection, All the Flowers Kneeling, has earned them numerous prizes and fellowships, as is only fitting. Please help me join our last poet, or, or help me welcome our last poet uh, of the evening as they come to the stage. Put your hands together for Paul Tran. Lipstick elegy. I climb down to the beach facing the Pacific Ocean, where torrents of rain shur the sand. On the other side, my grandmother sleeps soundlessly in her bed, her alyai of the whitest silk. My mother knew her mother died long before the telephone rang like bells announcing the last American helicopter leaving Saigon. Arrow shot back to its bow, long distance missile. I know she'd fly home if she could. She works overtime instead, curls her hair with hat rollers, rouges her cheeks like Gong Li and raise the red lantern. And I, I'm her understudy, hiding between the doorways of her grief and mine. I apply her foundation 
to my face, conceal the parts of me that she conceals, puckering my lips as if to kiss a man who would want me the way I wanted to be loved. And I said all their bewitching names aloud, Twisted Rose, Fuchsia in Paris, Irreverence. I picked the lipstick she would least approve, wrapped a white towel around my waist, danced for hours in the kitchen, checking my reflection in a charred skillet. I laughed her laugh, the way my grandmother used to laugh when she was alive, when she taught me how to pray from the you die be when I braided her hair in the unbearable heat, my tiny fingers weaving each silver strand into a fish tail, French twist, each knot, another child she never got to name, and I'm sorry, mother of my mother, immortal Buddha with a thousand hands chewing a fist, a beetle root, your teeth black as dawn, no child in our family stays a child their mother can love. Thank you so much. Everyone, please make some noise for yourselves. Wow, wow, wow. <sighs> my name is Paul Tran, and I'm the author of the debut collection, All the Flowers Kneeling, which my team has asked me to hold up for marketing purposes. <laughs> we are holding it up for the marketing purposes. Um, the poems in this collection emerged about nine years ago when I was raped, and that word rape does not appear anywhere in this book. The word trauma does not appear anywhere in this book because this is a love letter to other survivors. It's a love letter to the women in my family who've had to endure generations of sexual violence as part of the French Indochina War, the American War in Vietnam. It's a love letter to queer and trans people of color who survive every day and define and redefine what that looks like. And as the first in my family to read, write, and speak in English, I felt it was my responsibility to write their stories down, not only in literature, but in the historical record, so that no one can say we didn't exist, so that no one can say we didn't fight back. And I don't know, when it gets hard, I have to remind myself that there have been so many throughout history pulled by the same responsibility. One is an artist in 1620, her name Artemisia Gentileschi, and she was one of the few painters of her time to testify in public court against her abuser. And she made one of my favorite works of art, a painting called Judith Slaying Holofernes, which is about the story of the biblical figure Judith, who, when these soldiers invade her village, she and her maidservant goes into the tent of the general in the night. And you know, they do that thing, woo woo, wah wah. And after she seduces him, she pulls from her gorgeous dress this blazing sword and she beheads him. And so this last poem borrows its voice from the figure Judith, Judith slaying Holofernes. I know better than to leave the house without my good dress, my good knife, like a crucifix between my stone breasts. Oh, my mother, she'd have me whip. She'd have me kneel on rice until I shrilled so loud I rang the church bells. Didn't I tell you? She would remind me that elegance is our revenge, that there are neither victims nor victors, but the bitch we envy in the end. I am that bitch. I'm so dogged, so damn not even. Death wanted me. He set me back after you sacked my body the way your army sacked my village, stacked our headless idols in the same river where our children impaled themselves on rocks. I exit night. <laughs> I did. I enter your tent, gilded in this bolt of stubborn sunlight, my sleeves already rolled up, and I know what they'll say, slut, for showing this much skin, this irreverence for what is seen when I ask to be seen. Look at me, my thigh lifts from your thigh, my mouth spits poison into your mouth, you nasty beauty, I'm no beast, but when my blade slides, slides, slides through your thick neck, while my maid keeps your blood off me and my good dress, it will be a song the parish sings for centuries. Tell Mary, tell Eve, tell Salome and David about me and watch all their faces like yours turn green. Thank you so much. Give it up.
give one more time for Paul Tran. One more time for every poet who you heard tonight, who shared their words, their heart, their soul. That's our show. Please help me welcome back Hadi and Muhammad to close out the evening, our fantastic musicians. Please give it up for them. Do not forget, also, all of our authors' books are available. Please go. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it together. I like it. There, <laughs> I want to be inspired as we say that uh, all of our authors' books are available for sale in the lobby from our friends at The Strand. So please buy copies. If you have copies, buy another copy for a friend. Okay, bring their words home with you tonight. And this is not the last night of the festival. It's just the best night of the festival. Um, so visit uh, pen.org backslash festival and join us for more events tomorrow. With that, we wish you a very safe evening. Hope that you get home safe. Uh, my name is John Sands. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your night, everybody. Goodbye.